So, Lakmir Chawla. He is going to tell us uh, a little bit more of what he presented this morning quickly about removing pathogen from the circulation. The floor is yours. If you leave some time for discussion at the end, it will be nice so we can interact. Absolutely. Please. Thank you, and for those of you who are trying to see round two, I promise it will be different. And Michael Ioannidis will not be here, but I congratulated him on waking up and clearing his COVID fog. I've been waiting for him for 15 years to be passionate. He's, he's Austrian, it finally happened, so I'm, I'm delighted. And I told him that, just so you know, it's not behind his back. So I think what I want to talk to you guys about is just about where we are. And I was, and I was saying previously, we're in a very different place in Europe than we are in the US. And I think that one of the things which has been very compelling is the European experience has been much broader. And we've learned a lot more about where we initially thought pathogen removal would go um, when we did this. So it's a pretty straightforward device. And I think for this crowd, this is a pretty redundant slide. You guys have strong ability to put up different filters and cartridges have done things much more complicated. In the US, we typically have to run this with a dialyzer um, in addition in order for the machine to run, unless we run it on an intermittent machine, which is problematic in the ICU. Some, some folks can do it, but it's done, done very much. You have the ability here in Europe with many pumps and many devices to do a pure human perfusion modality. It's a very simple setup. Uh, it's a pretty quick prime. And I think the one thing to sort of recognize is that this filter, which is about the size of a Fresenius F80, <clears throat> has 40 meters squared of heparin. So even though it looks like it's around a 1.2, 1.8, 2 2.0 meters squared device, it's actually 40 meters squared because it's all beads and surface. And so it has an enormous capacity <clears throat> to remove pathogen. But the, one of the interesting things that we've come to understand is, well, why does heparin, which is something we use to treat coagulation disorders and make people anticoagulated, and you make it a surface, why does it suddenly change its function? And we've come to understand that we fell upon, and when I say we, I don't mean me, it's the scientists who really discovered this. Um, it started uh, at the Karolinska, actually. And what they found is that heparan, H-E-P-A-R-A-N, which is in your endothelial glycocalyx, is structurally nearly identical to heparin. So this device is providing replacement endothelial glycocalyx therapy. So in addition to removing pathogen, it actually removes ROS. It actually takes on other functions of removing microthrombosis and bacterial DNA and other PAMPs. And it's behaving like your glycocalyx because as a surface, it has a lot of the same functionality. And this has really changed the way we've attempted to look at the research and what this can remove and what it can do beyond pathogen. And we're at the very early stages of understanding this, but this is mostly an accidental discovery. That was not how this was developed. This was developed just for pathogen. The insight was that pathogens, when they become virulent, are attracted to heparin. And they then bind covalently to it, so it's a very strong adherence. And this was originally developed as a way to take care of pathogens that were not yet discovered. And in the US, this was part of a large medical countermeasure research program developed by DARPA, which is the US Department of Defense. So that's how I initially became involved in this. And when COVID came, which was an unknown pathogen, it worked for COVID. And that's where we've had our lion's share of experience also something which happened to our development program, it just wasn't planned, of course. <clears throat> now, I showed you a lot of that data earlier, so I'll skip through this quickly. You know, we've done some nice registry data in COVID. We've showed some very nice observational data and good case control data. These are data that were published in critical care that were the first two case reports that led to the emergency use authorization. And you know, we've treated now over 1,000 patients with COVID with very nice results. And I think the big question now is, well, what should this device really be doing? So the largest trial we're currently running is for pathogen-associated shock. So this is the septic shock definition, but you have a positive blood culture. Because I think one of the biggest critiques about this notion, whether it's this device or any device about removing pathogen, is well, what if the infection is in the lung? 
What if the infection is in the gut? What if the infection is in your leg? What if you have meningitis? Well, if the infection is in those places and you're just clearing the blood compartment of the pathogen, are you really accomplishing anything if they still have this very strong inflammatory nidus? And I think that is a, the right question. That's the appropriate question, right? And so our view of this is that we want to focus on septic processes wherein bacteremia or viremia is the bigger problem. And I'll give you three examples of this. One is a patient who is in septic shock who continues to be blood culture positive. I think we will all agree that past patient is going to do poorly. Now, why are you unable to clear the bacteria? Well, this is interesting because sometimes it's a sensitive organism. It's sensitive to piptazo, and you're giving piptazo and you're still growing it. Well, that's an opportunity to debulk it and give the antimicrobial a chance. The bigger problem that I think we all foresee and have taken care of are pan-resistant organisms. We're going to see more of these, and there's three reasons why it is an absolute guarantee that we will see more and more resistant organisms. Number one, we in America give all of our livestock metric tons of antibiotics. Why do we do this, aside from making the meat taste worse? We do it because you get more animals and you make more money. This is not going to stop because 10 cows are worth more than five cows. So you have an ecosystem where you have lots of resistance. We've tested pork in America. If you get some sausage or bacon, one third of it is MRSA positive, one third. Now you can say we should stop doing this. There's a lot of things in America we should stop doing that's not gonna stop because I think so. Or if I go back home and make it past security, they think it's okay. This is, a, this is life. We're gonna have more resistance. The second reason <clears throat> is because this is not anyone's fault, but antibiotics are not good business deals for big companies anymore. So the investment in new antibiotics is going down. This is just reality. And the third reason is, is because we have not developed sufficiently new classes of antibiotics where this plasmid exchange can occur. So I think the biggest place where we're gonna see the need for pathogen reduction in the bloodstream is for pan-resistant organisms for which you do not have good choices, like colistin or an aminoglycoside you've never heard of before. Right, this is where we are headed. This is a place where reduction of these assets is important. I think the other thing which is interesting is that as microorganisms take on more resistance, they lose fitness. So they're less aggressive. They're still virulent, they'll still kill you, but they tend to lose their fitness, which means they're more capable of being removed and giving the body's immune system a chance to work better. And so, we're currently enrolling in pathogen-associated shock. This is a form of shock for which you're positive blood culture because we think this is a place where a sepsis treatment directed at pathogen removal is rational. And I, I, I want to leave time to discuss because I want feedback from people on where else we think we should be going. We also uh, have really nice data in burn patients. They tend to get resistant organisms. We also have nice data in patients with ECMO who have long-standing cannula in place that cannot be easily replaced. Now, you could replace out the FemFem bypass every week. <laughs> That's not a great idea. But you don't have these options for ECMO. And as these cannula become infected or they become colonized, you tend to have ongoing infections that you need help clearing. This is where we see this tool in the toolbox gaining traction. So what I really want to have a discussion about is in what places do we think this makes the most sense? Where should we be studying it? To the conversation we had earlier about getting to the right endpoints. We know we have an effective tool. It leverages a known mechanism in the body, which is our glycocalyx, which is actually a non-immune pathogen sink. What else should we be doing? And just as a setup, as I mentioned, this sets up on all the standard machines. Um, you know, as I said in the US, we tend to be stuck doing with a dialyzer, even in patients without AKI. 
<clears throat> but there's many machines that are very effective in running it <clears throat> in Europe that are straight hemoperfusion. And I think that one of the things that's important is that you don't always require anticoagulation, but in general, I would say that this is a device that you should use anticoagulation with. All the standard uh, techniques have been used, um, systemic heparin, regional citrate, of course. And in the U.S. during COVID, we did have some very coagulopathic patients, and we've had some experience with our gatraban. Um, this slide I showed earlier, this is just to show you where I think that there's absolutely guaranteed to be translocation from the ventilator, Michael. And um, I'm just kidding. And this is an area where we think that there is still a lot of values in patients you can change their trajectory from someone who is going on high flow oxygen to avoiding intubation. You know, we've had really good data, case control data, showing this is meaningful with decreased length of stay, fewer ventilator days. But one of the interesting phenomenon for which we don't have a good answer is many of these patients actually demonstrated an improvement in oxygenation, which doesn't make a lot of sense because we're not doing anything directly to the lung when it happens. But the patients who, on an, as an observation, who do do better and respond quickly, we do typically see this run of improvement in oxygenation before they start to show us other improvements in hemodynamics, which I, I think is interesting. Um, this is the COSA data again, which I showed earlier, um, and I think the other thing that recognizes that it's really different in the way we're doing it in the U.S. The U.S. is really COVID-focused, but the experience in Europe is much more aligned to looking at true pathogen removal. I think the other thing which has been very interesting is, and I don't want to make this a country thing, but when we talk to our clinicians in different parts of Europe, their interest on where they think this can be used is very different. Um, and so I found that to be interesting, and I'm, I wonder if there's a different case mix or different kinds of infections or processes or therapeutics and surgeries that lead people to have different views. For example, there's some groups that are really interested in using this intraoperatively, and there's uh, some really interesting data emerging from that. We also see a group that's very interested in using this early in gram-negative sepsis that are gram, you know, are when they're culture positive. Um, and we have a large group that's interested in very much in this ECMO need for when patients become to have persistently bacteremic, become inflammatory on COVID, due, uh, on ECMO, excuse me, um, due to colonization or potentially infection. And so, um, you know, we're interested in hearing what other people <coughs> want to use this in because we know we have to design the right trials to generate the data that makes this durable. And I want to stop a little early and, and have that conversation. So I'll stop there and we'll see what people think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was a different presentation indeed from this morning, so that's great. A, a pleasant uh, surprise. Uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise. I uh, was checking, uh, we have no question from remote, but uh, I suppose uh, the audience may have a question, uh, especially if you're not sleeping. Yes, Thomas, and then Patrick. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so since we, we, this device targets uh, the, the, the pathogens, do you think we should uh, combine this device with the use of all these rapid diagnostic uh, tests? Because if we wait for the culture, it's going to be too late, right? Yeah, no, I think that's right. And, and, and just Tomas is being very modest. He's had extensive experience with the device. And I think this is right. Uh, I think that for centers that have T2 or BioFire, whichever the right ones are, especially if the first readout is a resistant organism, I think therein lies an opportunity to be early to a patient who you might have not gotten the right antibiotic to, or you may not get the response that antibiotic due to resistance. And I think emerging resistance is where this, I think, has the most activity. I think that's exactly right. We have to, if in order to be early, you have to use your early warning device to tell, the, meaning the diagnostic, to help you inform. I think that's exactly right. Great talk, Mink. I have a practical question. If you have in your ICU uh, severe malaria with 30% uh, parasitemia, is your device able to remove it or not? Yeah, so that's an amazing question, Patrick. We actually have a single case report of a patient in Oman 
that had um, malaria, and you know they had the device, they used it, and they had a, a child, I think it was 15% parasitemia, had a dramatic response and lived. It's, it's an end of one, we don't know what it means. I did not think or know that this removed parasite, and I don't, we don't even have good in vitro data for that, but for things like Babesia, things that are, you know, uh, you know, uh, tend to be in the bloodstream more, it, it's, com it's a compelling argument and interesting. So we're going to begin to do some more work there. And if it's meaningful, I think we're going to involve Gates and see the Gates Foundation and others that are interested in malaria and other tropical societies and see if there's value there. I think the other component, though, is, let's be honest, if you're in a lower middle income country and you want to use an extracorporeal system, you need a different delivery device because you're not going to roll in with a multi-filtrate pro in, you know, in the Congo, which is, you know, that's not going to happen. So I think that we, we have to be able to think about things we can do for those patients. If we get them in a more advanced system, yeah, I think it's rational. Um, but we're gonna, if we're going to ever study that, we need to have the platform to actually put on a device to do that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Other questions? Uh, I have a technical question yeah. related to the <clears throat> the device, and uh, it is uh, this special functionalization of the surface uh, requiring specific uh, priming uh, procedures preservation, uh, let's say, conservation procedures when you are in, uh, in storage and so on, transportation, yeah. all no, these aspects. Yeah, so this is a really interesting point because it's endpoint attached heparin. So when you, when you put heparin on the surface, and I'm not a surface chemist, but a lot of people in this room are smarter than I am for it, but it, the, the heparin has to be available, right? It has to be up and available to the surface to interact. So a lot of heparinized surfaces like oxygenators, the heparin is flat on the surface and doesn't interact. This is endpoint attached, so it's sitting up. The functional part of heparin is available. But because it's covalently endpoint attached, it's dry. It's not um, a, a, a liquid fill prime. I mean, you, you prime it with saline, and it's shelf-stable two years, dry pack, ETO sterilized. So I think the thing which is exciting about the product from a manufacturing standpoint is if it ends up working for malaria and things from middle or low income countries, there's a future where you could really make a lot of them and push the price down by scale and change the kinetics of its use because it has the shelf stability and the manufacturing was thought about before they did the tech. And we've all seen amazing devices, but you know, you, it's cold chipped, it's, it, you know, it's, it, it makes it really hard. So I think in that way, this has been a huge advantage. So I think this is a very important uh, concept. The other is training of the people that uh, should use this. What? Yeah, I think that, you know, to be honest, you know, we are just feeling our way on the best indication. We have a very broad label in Europe, and the label in Europe is pathogen removal, reduction, which, which is a nice label if you're a business, but I think we have some work to do on, as we talked about earlier, which patient and when, and I think the other th question, which is an open question, is dose. So for, for, for urea, we can do dose. We have k 2 we have URR, we can do all sorts of other modeling, but what's the right dose for pathogen? Well, I think you can make the argument until you're culture negative. Well, that's reasonable, but what if you're still PCR positive? So I think for all of these devices, the dose is an important question. The one very nice attribute is with 40 meters squared, you can't saturate this very easily, so you don't have to worry about switching it. But I do think duration of treatment, and should it be continuous, or can you do a six-hour treatment and get the same effect? In my mind, continuous is the way to go, because I think intellectually, you want to suppress the pathogen durably as long as you can. But I don't have data to support that. But that's just what I think in my brain. Do you have any information about the absorption of other substances? 
Yeah, we, so we've done some extensive work with um, uh, chemotherapeutic drugs, tr transplant drugs, and antimicrobials, and it has very little removal. Um, and we continue to test more and more uh, drugs as we go, but it doesn't seem to have significant adsorptive qualities um, with uh, uh, lots of medications that we, uh, we've worked with. I think probably the only exception to that is antithrombin-3, which we haven't tested, but there's some obvious rational belief that, that would, it would change the kinetics of AT3. Okay, so if you have to condense your message to this audience in one or two sentences, what would you say? I would say that there's three places where pathogen removal appears to be very important. It's in any patient who remains culture positive, despite your best therapeutic intervention, whether they're on ECMO from a cannula, whether it's a resistant organism or a patient who has high load. And in those patients, I think that this device is available and it's rational in the same way you put a drain in an abscess to debulk a patient who continues to give you pathogen in the blood. So thank you very much, uh, excellent.